Coming up on DTNS, carriage disputes migrate from cable TV to streaming. Europe makes USB-C the law and big companies working to actually make 2FA easier and better for everyone. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 31st, 2020 in uh, Studio Redwood. I'm Tom Merritt. <laughs> and I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm drawing the top stories from Cleveland. I'm Len Peralta. And uh, I'm the show's producer. Let me switch myself over here. Uh, Roger Chang. Uh, we are live from Sarah Lane's Studio Redwood, all three of us, Shannon, Sarah, mm -hmm. and I. Uh, mm -hmm. because I was coming up for my sister-in-law's birthday, and I'm like, well, while I'm in the area, I might as well just uh, hang out. So thank you, Sarah, for hosting us. Absolutely. And uh, we had we had some fun technical issues today, uh, and that's what happens when people make a big old track up to good old <laughs> Studio Redwood. I still blame that bay tree. The bay tree <laughs> has cursed me forevermore. It's it's definitely the Bay Tree. Uh, if you want to hear us uh, t explaining how, and in fact, doing some live <laughs> troubleshooting, uh, you have to become a patron and get patreon.com slash DTNS for good day internet. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. IBM announced that Arvind Krishna will take over as the company's 10th CEO, replacing Virginia, known as Ginny Romady. The change is effective on April 6th. Jim Whitehurst, Red Hat's former CEO, will step up as IBM's president. And Romady became, uh, became IBM president and CEO on January 1st, 2012. A beta build of Microsoft Edge shows a new adware blocking feature in testing on the browser. This would block things like toolbars and crypto miners. Edge already offers smart screen filter to protect against phishing and malware, and Microsoft has offered similar unwanted app blocking to enterprise customers through Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. Data from Sensor Tower Store Intelligence shows European mobile consumers spent an estimated $11.2 billion across Apple's App Store and Google Play Store during 2019, an 18.9% year-over-year increase in gross revenue from 2018. European spending accounted for 13.5% of global map app, of mobile app revenue in 2019, totaling more than $83 billion. Android Auto now has an option to silence all notifications when a user is driving. In fact, that was a real sticking point for a lot of users up until this point. The toggle is part of Android Auto's latest update. Notifications will still be persistent on an in-car display until they're dismissed, but only when this toggle is activated. The United States FCC says it will take action against an unnamed U.S. wireless carrier over the apparent unauthorized sale of real-time location data from users. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai said that the FCC's Enforcement Bureau has concluded that one or more more wireless carriers apparently violated federal law. All right, let's talk a little bit more about those Amazon earnings. We mentioned them on Good Day Internet yesterday, but give us the details, Shannon. All right. Amazon reported that it earned 6.47 per share on revenue of $87.4 billion, beating analysts' expectations of $86.01 billion in revenue on earnings of 4.04 cents. Amazon Web Services revenue grew 34% on the year to $9.95 billion, but saw revenue revenue growth slow for the sixth consecutive quarter. Subscription revenue actually increased 32% to $5.24 billion. Other revenue, which mostly consists of advertising, increased 41% to $4.78 billion. And Amazon announced on its earning call that Prime members now receive free Amazon Fresh deliveries. I'm very excited about this, which previously cost $14.99 a month. Amazon also said through public financial documents that its federal income tax expense for the year was more than $1 billion, in addition to more than $2 billion in other types of federal taxes, which is a bit of a pushback towards politicians and researchers claiming that Amazon does not pay any federal income tax. Yeah, and, and the pushback back on that is going to be, yeah, but you should be paying $3 billion, right? right? Yeah. Like, uh, It'll never be enough. That argument will <laughs> never end. But uh, yeah, I think they're making a point of saying, look, we do pay taxes uh, to, to try to combat some of that. Uh, more important here, I, I think, is the fact that, you know, Amazon's margins historically have been low. Recently, they saw some more profit. So having the expenses go up, uh, but still making, you know, $6.47 a share means that Jeff Bezos was right. 
you know, give us some time to keep spending money. And eventually we'll start breaking it in. And of course, AWS uh, is still strongly in, in front of Azure. Azure, of course, uh, making leaps and bounds, but, but AWS uh, certainly strong although it's starting to reach its saturation point and it's getting more competition from Google and Microsoft there. Uh, but overall, a, a very strong report from Amazon. We've now had re strong reports from Apple, uh, mm -hmm. from Amazon, from a few others like Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, Amazon now in market cap joins the one trillion club uh, right next to Apple and Microsoft. While Alphabet, at least it depends on what time you're looking at it. Alphabet seems to be kind of flirting with being out of the trillion and into the trillion. We'll get their uh, earnings next week. It's interesting that Prime members can now receive Amazon Fresh deliveries. Now, that's only in select markets, so mm -hmm. it's not just because you're a Prime member, all of a sudden you're going to get groceries delivered to your door. But Amazon kind of being like, you pay us that, you know, what? what is it now, 110 bucks a month or uh, a uh, yeah. annual? It, you get all sorts of perks because those subscription numbers, the company... Yeah, you know, they, they increased 32%. Yeah. Subscription yeah. is what, what Amazon, they, they, they don't care if, if there's certain things that are a lost leader. As long as they, they have enough folks who are paying them a certain amount of money each year, it's working. Yeah, bringing in, bringing in that consistent income while then uh, for the holiday quarter, uh, capitalizing on that to spend more money to do that one day delivery, but that causing more people to shop with them in, in in a quarter when retail apparently wasn't as strong as as people might have hoped it to be amazon's quarter was fantastic and i think you know one probably leads to the other let's talk about microsoft and books shall we microsoft launched a bug bounty program for its xbox gaming platform so this is specific to xbox anybody can submit bugs on the xbox live network and services with payouts ranging from 500 bucks to $20,000 based on severity, quality of the submission, and impact on the Xbox gaming service. So uh, this is this is a pretty interesting bug bounty program, Shannon. It's not that Microsoft's first. They've obviously had bug bounty programs for Windows and Office and other things for a long right. time, but but going to Xbox and and what what do you think of this spread of payouts? Uh, it makes sense. If you look at the whole spread of payouts a as a total, uh, of course, they have like remote code executions at the top, and those are going to be the most advanced of the different options. And then way down at the bo bottom, they have spoofing and tampering, which will give you a payout of something between 1000 to 5000 depending on the severity. The RCEs, elevation of privilege attacks, those are the kind of things that pay out quite a bit more from anywhere between one to five for elevation of privileges and then five to 15,000 for RCEs. Um, I did want to mention too, even though they introduced this bug bounty, that doesn't mean that anybody who's interested in, in, interested in exploiting attack vectors on Xboxes will get payouts. You have to stick within their bug bounty. There are some restrictions. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's very common and very constant with bug bounties. So if, for example, with this one, if you're doing phishing or social engineering against Xbox users, or if you're doing something like uh, downloading or accessing sensitive Xbox user data, that's still outside of the mm -hmm. scope of a bug bounty. So you want to make sure that if you're interested in doing this, you're not getting into those kind of things. Yeah. And, and even though anybody can submit one, you, you have to have a clear and concise proof of concept. Yes. Uh, they're going to need to be able to uh, re reproduce the vulnerability yes. themselves before fixing. So it's not like anybody can just kind of come up with something and, and expect to get paid. You're going to have to come up with something that is actually a vulnerability that hasn't been exploited before. And then Microsoft is willing to pay up to $20,000 for, for severe bugs. We know Google will pay up to $1.5 million. That's true, but that's also for... <laughs> Although they didn't actually platform. pay anybody for... Yeah, they didn't pay anybody <laughs> let's, that Let's see their Stadia bug program. Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, Poor Stadia. <laughs> yeah, for for comparison, right? Because yeah, I think uh, Microsoft has a different rate card for Windows than it does for Xbox, for sure. Yeah. The European Parliament voted 582 to 40 in favor of the resolution on a common charger for mobile radio equipment. In other words, uh, mobile phones, but also tablets and and basically mm -hmm. anything that has a a mobile uh, radio modem in it. The European Commission now has until July to adopt an actual law, an act, 
related to the Charger Harmonization Directive from 2014 or introduce a similar legislative measure. The resolution hopes that the adoption of a common charger will cut down on e-waste because you can just keep using your cables over and over and over again and your wall warts. And it warns against fragmentation in the wireless charging space as well. The resolution specifically calls out wireless charging saying many mobile telephones already use wireless charging methods and that fragmentation in this area should be avoided. Calls therefore on the commission to take measures to best ensure the interoperability of different wireless chargers with different mobile radio equipment. Uh, and that was one of my concerns is like, well, wait, if you require a cable, are you gonna ride it in a way where wireless charging is left out? Uh, not only that, not only are they including wireless, but they're saying, and when wireless is there, we should probably have a standard for that. Let's work against fragmentation of wireless, which actually the Qi charging seems to have kind of taken over that market. So I don't think that is too tall of an order. Apple still is against this though, because they, they're they saying, look, if you make us change to a non-lightning charger, then everybody's gonna throw away their lightning cables and that's e-waste. But they did have a previous charger before lightning. The so they have changed yeah. chargers before. This wasn't oh, wouldn't be a first the for them. That. Yeah. I would like to see everybody use USB C. I would too. And and it's happening more and more. And in fact even Apple is doing it mm -hmm. uh, with, with an iPad. Yes. Uh, they, they're not doing it in their phones yet. But I, I, think, I think they're resistant because Apple likes to move to something when they know it's perfect for them. They don't like mm -hmm. to be told when to do it. And I don't think they've put USB-C in the iPhone yet because they haven't quite figured out how to make it work the way they want it to work to be charitable. And I think the problem with e-waste, it's definitely an issue that we need to solve worldwide, but it's not something that's just specifically aimed at Apple, for example. Like this is an issue that all companies need to focus on. And there are ways that you can recycle cables that, that is completely recyclable. However, you have to go through a, a sustainable way of doing so and go to a company that will recycle those. I believe like Best Buy has a uh, e-waste option or e-recycling mm -hmm. yeah, option. Yeah, here in the US, that's true. Yeah, yep. yeah. I mean, the idea that wireless charging should be included and should certainly, you know, it's not, we're not quite ready for that yet, but it's it's on the way. I get why the European Parliament, and, well, and, and to a larger extent, the European Commission is like, okay, let, let's definitely add this in because we're going to get to that point and we don't want to make wireless charging not the standard. A company like Apple is like, but we want wireless charging to be the only standard. And everybody else is going to seem very arcane with these you know, old cables that, that, that we as Apple don't use anymore. So something like this forces Apple to be like, Okay, well, we still have to have that connector in this phone that was going to be super sleek and wireless only. Now I know that that's that's again I'm I'm well I'm moving ahead a couple cycles, but yeah, I yeah. think that that's what Apple's thinking to itself. Although uh, we'd have to wait to see what the European Commission draws up. They could draw this up in a way that says if you have sufficient wireless charging then and no cable, that's okay. They could make that okay, and I wonder if Apple would be all right with that, or if it's really about the fact that they just don't want, for the devices that are gonna still have a lightning cable, because not every device is gonna, is gonna be put out by Apple with only wireless charging, they wanna continue to use lightning. They don't wanna switch. And, I, and when it comes down to it, it's costly for them mm -hmm. to do that, uh, unless they're doing it on their own pace and at their own direction. Well, Reuters reports that according to sources, the FBI is investigating the Israeli software company NSO Group for possible attacks against U.S. citizens, companies, as well as gathering intelligence of foreign governments. The investigation reportedly began in 2017 to look into if NSO Group obtained code from U.S. attackers and hackers to crack into smartphones. Facebook filed a lawsuit in October against NSO Group, accusing it of exploiting a flaw in WhatsApp. Sources say that the FBI is now looking into how NSO provides technical support to customers, which could possibly be prosecuted under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act if they had knowledge of improper use. NSO says that it is not aware of an inquiry and has not been contacted by U.S. law enforcement about such matters. NSO Group sells its products to governments and has previously said that its government customers are the only ones who could use it for attacks. 
This is very interesting yes. because one would assume that at the FBI would also potentially, and we don't know this, but potentially be a customer of NSO Group because or that's the who NSA. NSO Group says they sell to is government agencies. Yes. And even if the FBI is not, you're right. It could be the NSA, it could be the Department of Justice, could be the Pentagon, could be all other parts of the branches. Of and the and we know from previous uh, uh, reports and things that have leaked that even if one part of the U.S. government has access to some kind of application that allows them to exploit a vulnerability, that does not necessarily mean that another part of our U.S. government would know about that. So if, if the FBI had access to something, who's to say that the NSA wouldn't too or would not? Uh, this is pretty interesting, too, in the fact that they say that government customers are the only ones who could use their exploits for attacks, because we also know that if something exists, if it did get into the wild somehow, somehow and while this is not you know, necessarily a part of the story, uh, that doesn't mean that somebody else could use the same exploit for something. And yeah. if they know about that, or if they know like they got breached and something got stolen, or hackers gained access to their exploits, there's still that potential uh, uh, possibility that they could be prosecuted for something like that, too. I mean, the Facebook lawsuit from October, you mentioned, exactly. Shannon. Okay, well, if, if NSO Group did indeed exploit a flaw in WhatsApp, who's to say who else did not, exactly. did or did not? Yeah, and, and I think what, what, what the FBI, at least in public, is saying is we're looking to see if the NSO Group knowingly allowed its code to be used by criminals. Yes. Right? NSO Group says never. Uh, we give it to governments. Governments might give it to criminals, but that's not our problem. And and so that's where I, I, I think it's, you start to see the gray area of NSO Group saying, sure, government of another country will give you this. Don't tell us what you're using it for. Wink, wink. And wink, can the wink. FBI <laughs> then go in and say, you knew that that government was going to use it to attack us? Uh, and win that in a court of law. It, 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 and that starts to make me think, and again, this is just speculation, wild speculation on my part, that the FBI found out that the NSO group was selling a vulnerability that they thought they were the only customer of to <laughs> someone who was using it against someone else and said, Ooh. you know what, that's not cool, NSO group. And the NSO group says, what are you going to do, sue us? <laughs> And they did. <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, again, that's I, I'm creating fictional scenarios, yes. right? Uh, this, these are worthy of a it's thriller. It's plausible, novel, though. But, it's plausible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think the timing is kind of interesting in that we know from the Reuters report that uh, the FBI was talking to Jeff Bezos about his own hack on his phone, uh, which a lot of people are speculating mm -hmm. may had to do with the NSO group as well. Yeah, the U.S. executive branch, no big fan of Jeff no. Bezos because he owns the Washington Post. Um, but that doesn't mean- But Jeff mean Bezos also has most of the money in the world. Yes. So <laughs> it, when, when sometimes, and again, doesn't mean that right. he gets to dictate what the FBI is doing or not doing, but it, sometimes leads to a little bit more speculation of what kind of influence and power might have come from his camp. And that's another scenario that we can tie this all together is even if, forget personal feelings about Bezos, if they find out that, say, Saudi Arabia used code from the NSO group to attack Jeff Bezos, that would fit the facts in what the FBI is saying they think the NSO group did. Ooh. Yeah, even if they sure, were working I'm, with the NSO group previously. And we don't know that that's what they're doing, but of public available facts, that is, again, something that fits the pattern. So we're, mm. we're thinking about. Roku announced that seven apps from Fox will stop working two days before the Super Bowl. That's Super Bowl Sunday, everybody. Fox Sports was previously working to bring 4K HDR streams of the Super Bowl to Roku's streaming sticks, pucks, and TVs. Now, Roku tells The Verge that its distribution agreement with Fox expired, and therefore it is now forced to remove the apps. Basically, they're at a standstill. That's what Roku says. Fox said in a statement, Roku's tactics are a poorly timed negotiating ploy, fabricating a crisis with no thought for the alarm it generated among its own customers. Those aren't loaded words at all. No. <laughs> shots, shots definitely fired there. NFL spokesman Alex Reithmiller tells Fast Company, don't worry. The NFL will stream the game through its own free Roku app, although it won't be in 4K. Certainly not as weighty as the last story, but there's a lot of similarities here of, you know, negotiations behind the scenes right. and who's who's blaming who. But uh, we thought 
that carriage disputes were the provision of cable TV, where, you know, a CBS or a Fox wants more money from the cable TV company. The cable TV company doesn't get it. And so they both blame each other about why the channel isn't available on the cable TV system anymore. That's happened time and time again over the decades. This is one of the first times I've seen this big of a dispute where what it looks like is Roku probably had, and again, we're back in speculation territory, probably had a deal with Fox that said, all right, we'll uh, cut, you know, we'll promote your app in our app store above other apps. Maybe we'll give you some free ads. You cut us in with a revenue share uh, or you provide some programming for our free Roku channel. And when that distribution agreement was up for renewal, Fox didn't want to give Roku what it wanted this time around. So Roku said, fine, we'll cut off your app. Because remember, they're not just removing it from the app store because the existing apps would still work. They're stopping the Fox apps, all seven Fox apps from working for any Roku customer. Uh, that's, that's really throwing down the gauntlet at Fox. And Fox is like, we're not stopping Roku from letting our apps work. So, so it's their fault, not ours. That's going to disappoint a lot of customers who are current users of the applications on Roku. Yeah, I you know for 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 folks who have other options, it's sort of like all right, well, I'll just use the Fox app somewhere else. But if you if if everything goes through Roku, mm -hmm. and two days before the Super Bowl, you're like, what? That's I, come on now. That's the way I was going to watch the game, and I care about it. Doesn't mean everybody's going to care about it, but a lot of people do. You 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 know it, it might be easy to blame Fox, like oh they're you know they're playing hardball, and Fox is like, no, we're not. Roku's playing hardball here, and yeah. NFL's like. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Don't worry. We, we are the NFL. We, we don't want, care about 4K anyway, we right? We want you to watch the game. Yeah. 4K, sorry. <laughs> Can't do that, but we will save the day. And, and, and it's important to, to clarify, these, these, yes, these apps are only used by people who have a subscription. Whether it's a, a over-the-top subscription like YouTube TV or Hulu or it's a traditional cable subscription, that's what these Fox apps are for. But the Super Bowl is available even without that login. Uh, that's that that's you know that's usually the way it's done. And so this is cutting down on a lot of people who are like, oh, this is how I'll watch it in 4K, even though I don't have a cable subscription at all. Uh, now they'll have to either go to some other situation or subscribe to Hulu Live or YouTube TV or something like that. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Apple's WebKit team published a proposal on GitHub to standardize the format of one-time passcodes sent over SMS. Google is launching an open project to let anybody be able to build their own second factor dongle. We have two big near trillion or over trillion dollar companies making two-factor authentication easier for everyone. Let's dig into these a little bit. Uh, Apple's WebKit team published a proposal that would send a two-line SMS, one for human verification with the code, and confirmation of what website sent it. The second line would then have the site URL and the code preceded by a pound sign. The goal here is to have browsers and messaging apps recognize the domain automatically from the message and extract the code to complete the second factor login without the user needing to interact, preventing them from accidentally putting that code into a phishing website that isn't the proper website. This would make sure it goes to the right website. The proposal claims feedback from Google has been positive on this standard with Google product manager Stephen Sonoff and software engineer Sam Goto. What a great program name, Goto. Uh, <laughs> Sam Goto providing feedback in development. So it looks like Apple has got Google at least partially on board for this. This may be something where you say, well, I don't want this. I want to be in control of this. But for uh, more casual users like my mother, for instance, I would absolutely love if she didn't have to worry about being tricked into putting her second factor code into the wrong site. Yes, there's problems with SMS. We'll get to that. Uh, let's talk about this other project from Google. Google launched an open SK uh, for a Rust-based firmware to turn Nordic chip dongles into FIDO, UTF and FIDO2 compliant security keys. So making your own physical key with open source firmware that you didn't have to rely on anybody else for. This is great for developers. Google says Nordic's dongles are affordable and support all the FIDO2 standards like NFC and Bluetooth LE. Google does plan to expand the project to other chips as well, but they're starting with Nordic because of that. While Google advises the project be used for testing and research purposes at the moment, Keitel Holstead, the director of product management at Nordic, hopes the project will help the industry gain mainstream adoption of security keys by just making more products available, right? 
these are these are both great second factor stories, right? Jane? Yes, yes, they are. Um, you know, I have heard a little bit of an argument from the InfoSec community hearing about this first one with Apple WebKit in the fact that it still relies on SMS. Sure. But the problem is a lot of websites have not caught on to physical hardware tokens or app-based or app-based uh, one-time passcodes for two-factor authentication. So the fact that we are getting something that can help you protect against phishing attacks or attacks that spoof websites is definitely a nice add-on to two-factor authentication over SMS. Now, it would be great if we didn't have to rely on SMS for this, but some websites, again, still do. So I like the fact that they are including this for folks who want that convenience of having more security, but don't necessarily want to rely on having to copy and paste it into a website, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're relying on the fact that a, a lot of users may not necessarily check the website's address before they put in that one-time code, and they could potentially get spoofed in that sense. Now, this doesn't protect against sims, sim swapping either. That would still be an issue, uh, but this does protect against the phishing aspect and the spoofing aspect of websites. On the other hand, you have the Google one with the open source tool. Uh, I personally love this one because this is something that I would potentially use. Uh, they're completely open sourcing this. The Nordic chip, the little physical chip, it's a little USB chip. It's 10 to 20 bucks online. Oh, yeah. I looked it up, super, super inexpensive uh, in Rust to program it. So if you know a little bit of Rust, you could probably program this yourself or just copy and paste their open source code and compile it for your own uses. Uh, I could definitely see hackers using this for all sorts of things. Uh, if you run your own server, at home. You could implement 2FA on that to log in. Your own private 2FA. Yeah. You could use your own private 2FA. So this would be wonderful for folks who don't necessarily want to use a third-party vendor's uh, FIDO2 compliant security device and they want to create their own. They could use a Nordic chip and compile their own two-factor authentication and then they're not relying on any other vendor right there. It's such an interesting platform and mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of surprised it took this long to do some kind of open source platform for FIDO2 compliant 2FA, but it's wonderful. Like all my hacker friends are totally going to get on this and buy like Nordics are going to sell out everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you could tell a story here, which is uh, SMS second factor is better than no second factor. Yes. And for a lot of people, and because you say a lot of websites only offer it, uh, it's good to have something that prevent at least some of the weaknesses, not all of them, but some of them. Yeah. But what we need is more popularization of hardware dongles, which means we need more people to make them, to make them more ubiquitous and make them cheaper. And that's what the second project from Google does. So exactly. That's, uh, that's really good. I think some uh, two-factor authentication FIDO compliant physical tokens are still a little bit cost prohibitive to mm -hmm. folks. Yeah. Uh, and if this could be something where like maybe somebody bulk orders the Nordic products and then gives those away to their friends and family yeah. uh, that could lower the cost of these put and them in a hello kitty case so suddenly people you are know interested they do in have them. an open source thingiverse 3d printed case as Boom. well for this yeah. so i could totally paint it to be hello kitty <laughs> or sailor moon <laughs> Definitely Sailor Moon. <laughs> <laughs> Hello Kitty and Sailor Moon, not always on our subreddit, <laughs> but, much. but but very infrequently do make it up there. And that's if you care about stories. Thanks to everybody who participate in our subreddit. As you know, you can submit stories. You can also vote on other folk stories at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join in our conversation in our Discord. It's going on 24-7 pate. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. What is in that old mailbag there? Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Justin wrote in, and he had, a, he had an interesting thought of how much not having good broadband internet can really bring down a system. Justin works for the state court system in IT and deals with mostly rural courts that are on DSL, satellite, mobile hotspots, or maybe even nothing at all. Justin says, it makes IT support a nightmare. It takes a very long time to transfer any software that they need. A remote desktop can be a lag nightmare. The other major issues is the courts that are required to upload information to the DMV or send over an order of protection to the police and many other important things. A lot of my locations have to drive to the next town just to upload their information. This causes a delay and put people in danger. The U.S. needs to push for better infrastructure and push ISPs to go into rural places and get them internet. 
the world requires internet and the U.S. is far behind in infrastructure. Uh, yeah. And, 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 you know, I was saying yesterday that most places in the U.S. have sufficient bandwidth for Netflix. And that probably wasn't the reason that Netflix was slowing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a big problem with infrastructure in the places that don't have them. And I appreciate Justin writing in and sharing his experience about that, because it's important to note that most is not all or even all that we need. And and there is there is a gap there that needs to be filled for, for very important reasons. Yeah, absolutely. That whole idea of driving to the next town to yeah, upload yeah. something, you know, when it comes to the cops. I'm like, oh, <laughs> is that not a good system? Hey, shout out to our patrons. A very good system indeed at our master and grandmaster levels, including Philip Less, Frederick Hubner, and James P. Callison. All right, let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us, Len? Well, you know, you had a little bit of bugginess this at the beginning of the show and I we also talked about the Microsoft bug bounty hunter so I thought it only apropos to uh to draw the uh the bug bounty hunter from Microsoft <laughs> there, there. He is. I love pulling it. out and now if only are the audio issues were sort of like the uh, the bugs you could just go and squash them when uh, we needed when him the... to come yeah, in and squash absolutely. that bug. I like this guy... that you have a Thor-like bounty hunter with a bug in his hand that he's ready to squash. <laughs> that bug looks so sad and sorry. Well, <laughs> you know what? He shouldn't have been around. That's the thing. And he's bringing in like 20 grand for this guy. So, you know, there's always a good thing. So, what um, has he got on his hip there? Oh, those are little, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, controllers, right? He's got ah, like a controller. Because ah, it's Xbox an Xbox one. bug bounty. That's of right. Of course, makes sense. There you go. For yeah, sure. if you wanted to see this, you can go right now to my Patreon, patreon.com for, patreon forward slash Len. You can always get it at my online store, at lenperaltastore.com. And by the way, uh, I'm open for commissions too. If anybody wants to hire me for uh, a commission, Valentine's Day is coming up. Some other great, you know, if you have anything else, uh, go to lenperaltastore.com and get that started, so. Well, normally I would just thank Shannon Morse, which I'm about to, but I also want to thank Tom Merritt because both <laughs> of them came on up to Studio Redwood and uh, and hung out with uh, a, a plethora of audio issues, but we made it happen because we're such a great team. Uh, so it's it's really nice to have everybody here with me today. Well, some of us anyway. It's lovely to be here. Roger, thank you for having it is. Well, of course, Roger and Leonard are are in their remote locations, but <laughs> it is uh, it's 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 my first guests here at Studio Yay! Redwood. Yeah, at least doing this show. Um, so thanks to you guys for coming up. Um, quite a pleasure. Shannon, let folks know where they can keep up with all the rest of your work because you're very busy. Sure. Also, highly recommend commissioning Len. I had him do a exclusive piece of merch for my patrons mm -hmm. on my yeah. own channel, and they absolutely loved it. So thank you, awesome. Len, for that. Well, uh, Snupsy.com or YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse is where you can go to see all of my updated tech reviews, my recent CES videos, and a huge announcement that I'm moving over to Colorado soon. Ooh. Yeah, I bought a house, so I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of smart home nice. tech reviews when that happens. Mm -hmm. So that's going to happen Those really soon. Excuse to geek out on that stuff. I agree. <laughs> Uh, folks, uh, we uh, get a weekly Threatwire update uh, from Shannon that we share with you, uh, but that only goes to patrons. Uh, if you want to get that update, you got to become a patron, patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Write us with questions, comments, all sorts of good stuff. We just love your feedback. We're also live Monday through Friday. If you can join us, please do. That's 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21 p.m. Eastern. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with the changing role of the modern IT department and Karen the Forrest as our guest. Talk to you then. Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>